There is warfare tonight between Russia and Finland. There is continued naval action in the West. And at this time, the Columbia Broadcasting System presents an analysis of these events by Elmer Davis and Major George Fielding Elliott. And now, here is Mr. Davis. The Russian attack on Finland seems to be regarded the world over as the most indefensible of all such actions that the totalitarian states have committed in recent years. The uh, Osservatore Romano, the Vatican City newspaper, speaks of a worldwide wave of indignation over Bolshevism's new aggressive policy, and from the dispatches we have received from all over Europe and from Washington as well, this seems to be no overstatement. The Italian press is evidently held pretty closely under wraps on this matter, but they have been vigorously opposed to uh, communism in recent weeks and have been criticizing it sharply, and it is said there is grave misgiving in Italian government quarters. There is, of course, a violent reaction to this in England and France and in the Scandinavian countries above all, where they are horrified by this attack on another Scandinavian country and uncertain if they may come next. As the Osservatore Romano says, it is of essential importance to realize that this not only menaces the independence of a single country, but means the further progress of communism in Europe, end quote. Only the Germans content themselves with saying that Russia must have an outlet to the sea. And, of course, the communist explanation of this, as I have received it in a number of letters, is that uh, this is not aggression, it is not imperialism, that the Russians, if they go into Finland, will be doing so only for the purpose of liberating Finland. President Roosevelt, coming back from the South today, was met by Secretary of State Hull at the Union Station in Washington. They held a long conference later, and it is reported that the president may confer with the congressional leaders of both parties about foreign policy. This, however, is not confirmed. Remember that the United States offered its good offices to Russia and Finland to help in any way it might in the settlement of this dispute, and the Finns accepted this. But Mr. Potemkin, the Russian vice commissar of foreign affairs, told our charge d'affaires at Moscow that the offer came too late and he saw no occasion to use the good offices of the United States at this time. So the Finnish acceptance of the Russian terms the other day came just too late. The Russians had broken off diplomatic relations just before the Finnish minister could present this note which accepted the principal Russian demand calling for a withdrawal from the frontier near Leningrad. And there is evidence for the belief that the Russians knew that this note was on the way and broke off relations so that they wouldn't have to accept it. The story of the Russian invasion was withheld from the Russian people for 16 hours, and when it was finally sent out, they said that they had to cross the frontier to repel a new Finnish attack. This is, of course, the same thing that Hitler said in Poland. This is a matter of counterattack with pursuit. And the Russians uh, insist that the Finns have attacked again. Now, as to this uh, allegation that this means the further progress of communism, Premier Molotov of Russia said yesterday that Russia has no intention of interfering with Finland's internal affairs. All they wanted is for the Finns to get rid of the government. And leaflets dropped in Helsinki this morning in the first flight of Russian aviators over the city said that Soviet Russia doesn't wish the Finnish people any harm. If they only get rid of General Monerheim, Premier Kayander, and Foreign Minister Erko, they will have peace. Perhaps relying on this rain of leaflets, people were out in the streets thickly this afternoon when another attack came, and then another, and the last attack was made at night by the light of the fire set by the earlier attacks. Now we have a report which comes from Helsinki and is repeated in Copenhagen and dispatches from Helsinki to that city that Russia has sent an ultimatum which expires at 3 a.m. Moscow time, which would be 8 p.m. our time, demanding the complete surrender of Finland... Otherwise, Helsinki and other cities will be wiped off the map, not leaving a trace, so runs the text of the story. And the Copenhagen newspaper Berling Schettidende reports that Mr. Tonner, the former uh, Finnish premier and finance minister, has been empowered to seek an armistice and also reports that the Finnish government resigns. Now, this is only the report of one newspaper in Copenhagen, although it is a paper which is very well informed about Baltic affairs. This is not a political story now. It's a military story. And here is our military expert, Major George Fielding Elliott, who can clear up some of the points for us. Major, where can Finland most effectively be attacked? I think, Mr. Davis, that uh, the first point of attack on land is certainly the Karelian Isthmus between Lake Ladoga and the Gulf of Finland. It's a narrow isthmus, about 36 miles wide, more than half covered by lakes, making the actual area in which the Russians can attack only about 15 to 18 miles. The best roads and railways between Russia and Finland lead through this isthmus. 
The lakes are not yet frozen. I've had a very late summer, or rather late fall over there. And the Finns have fortified the Isthmus very strongly. They have a few gunboats on Lake Latica, but of course the Russians can put in a very much stronger naval force on the lake. Moreover, the Finnish right flank here is exposed to attack direct from the Gulf of Finland. And indeed, the whole Finnish coast is exposed to such attacks, and the Russians apparently have already landed at one or two points, notably near Hango, which is one of the places they were demanding from Finland, near the entrance to the Gulf. The only hope here would be the intervention of the Swedish fleet, and that seems a pretty far-fetched hope tonight. The air support necessary for a Russian landing can be obtained from their new bases in Estonia. North of Lake Latiga, the Finnish frontier with Russia has no very good communications. It would be very hard to carry on any extensive military operations here, except that way up at Tetsuno on the Arctic Ocean, the Russians had a small concentration, which apparently has been strong enough to occupy that port whose fall is reported. That was another one of the places where the Russians were demanding concessions from Finland. Finally, Finland can be attacked, of course, directly from the air, and that appears to be the main uh, objective of the Russians at this moment. The Russian uh, air force is, of course, immensely superior to the Finnish air force, isn't it? What is the comparative strength of the land and air forces available? Well, the Russians have about 3,500 first-line planes. Of course, the actual strength of the Russian air force is not accurately known, but that seems to be a pretty good guess. And the Finns have about 200. The Soviet Navy has two old battleships, which are not in very good condition, and four quite new cruisers, 20 or 30 destroyers, and more than 100 submarines available in the Baltic. The Finnish Navy consists of two little coast defense ships armed with 10-inch guns, which are quite new and were built for the purpose of defending that exposed right flank that I spoke of, and a handful of gunboats and submarines. Nothing uh, very strong there. The, on the other hand, if the Swedish Navy could come in to help the Finns, they might possibly be able to upset, on sheer efficiency, the naval balance in the Gulf of Finland. The Finnish Army consists, in its first line, of three divisions, a cavalry brigade and a chasseur brigade, which includes the famous... Uh, Finnish ski troops. Total at war strength of about 70,000 plus perhaps 140,000 trained reserves of all sorts. And the full military manpower of Finland approaches a half million, including the Civic Guard, Land Bear, and so forth. Russia has a huge army, said to total 14 million, including all classes of reserves, but can actually make available against Finland probably not more than 30 to 40 divisions. A total with corps and army troops of perhaps six to 800,000 men. Do you think there's any military significance in this reported ultimatum with its uh, threat of blowing Helsinki off the map if uh, it's not accepted? Well, this illustrates to me the possibilities of air power as a weapon striking directly at the civil will, at the morale of the civilian population, passing over the old situation where the enemy's armed forces had to be overcome in order to win a victory in war. It illustrates the helplessness of a small state with a large neighbor with an overwhelming air force as was already, of course, illustrated by the German operations against Poland, which air power bore so important a part. Air power will not be so lightly used, as we have seen in the West, in this fashion, where reprisals are to be anticipated. This indicates further that Russia realizes the difficulty of ground attack because of the difficult terrain and wants to get this war over with as quickly as possible. Of course, we noted this morning that the very first of these Russian air raids was on the airport at Helsinki, so that presumably they were trying to put the Finnish uh, air force, such as it is, out of action right there, just as the Germans did against Poland. Today. Now, we've uh, had a story from Sweden that the Swedes are building up their own defenses. They have not proceeded to the extent of mobilization, but they're evidently calling up some new troops. But it is uh, pointed out that there is no obligation to lend any military aid to Finland. You thought that the, that the Swedish Navy was so efficient that it might be able to make head against the Russians in the Baltic? I think it could if, of course, the Swedes are going to move at all. It seems that uh, there was only some Benjamin Franklin up there to repeat Benjamin's famous remark about hanging together instead of, uh, in order to avoid hanging separately. It might be a very good idea because those Scandinavian nations are certainly in a very bad situation if the Russians occupy Finland. I believe in your article in the Herald Tribune this morning, Major, you defined an aggressor under modern conditions as a small nation which has something that a great nation wants. And, of course, uh, that would apply to the other Scandinavian states 
once Finland is gobbled up. What do you think are the Russian objectives in this attack, or possibly long-term objectives, uh, when they once got past their initial objectives? Well, of course, the uh, Russian account is that what they want is the security of Leningrad, which includes an important industrial district and is pretty close to the frontier. And they want to get positions covering the Gulf of Finland so that Leningrad will not be menaced by any attack coming from the sea or from the Finnish frontier. There used to be a story going around that Finland was going to be a bridgehead for a German attack on Russia. If this is true, if this is still in the Russian mind, it is certainly a curious commentary on the present state of Russo-German relations. But also, we have the report from Oslo to the effect that Russia is going to demand three Norwegian ports on the Atlantic. Russia has always wanted an ice-free port. This seems to me to mark the abandonment of the seeking of world revolution, uh, the revolution of the proletariat by the old scheme of boring from within, because this most certainly will alienate foreign sympathy for the Communist Party and bring to an end any hope of the Communist Party getting anywhere in this country and in a lot of other countries, too. A return to the old methods of czarist imperialism and of the expansion of Russian territory and perhaps, of course, of communist influence by force of arms. It would be a slow and difficult matter for the Russians to get across the country in the northern part there of Finland, Norway, and Sweden, wouldn't it? The railroads all run north and south. There are no transverse railroad lines. And so do the rivers, and there are terrific mountains up there. The rivers are all against them, so to build a railroad across to those uh, Norwegian ports would be a task of tremendous engineering difficulty. But, of course, if they succeeded in putting enough pressure on the Scandinavian government, they might get session of all that territory before they had to occupy it. I With Finland as a horrible example of what happens to people who resist them. Yes, exactly. Now, we had uh, one other story from the war in the West. Report of these uh, British, uh, the original stories had British cruisers and later British destroyers, which were coming into a Norwegian port near Stavanger. And uh, they were said to have been report- said to have reported that they had been damaged in the storm, but uh, there was some belief that they had been damaged in military action. What do you think the significance of that would be if oh. they actually had been damaged in a naval action? There was a report yesterday about a battle between the British ships and uh, German aircraft off the Norwegian coast that might have some connection with it. Apparently, from German reports, Vice Admiral Marshall, who commands the battleship squadron was out in the North Atlantic at the time of the sinking of the Rabel Tindy. If that was the case, he probably went out to cover the Deutschmann and uh, escort her into port. And the sinking of the Rabel Tindy re- revealed the presence of the Deutschmann and other German ships in this area, so the British concentrated off the Norwegian coast to try to cut them off. And then the German Air Force went out to try to break up this concentration and assist in covering the retirement of the German ships safely into port. And this certainly illustrates what has already been illustrated a number of times, the remarkable coordination the Germans are getting between their air force and their naval forces in the North Sea, from which the British might do well to take a lesson. Now, that uh, we had the story the other night. Some of the German papers are saying that Germany commands the North Sea and the North Atlantic. Uh, that is certainly an exaggeration, isn't it? But uh, they're true. their ships are able to move about with more freedom than we would have expected more freedom than they were in the last war, and if the vice admiral commanding the battleship squadron can fly his flag out from almost off the coast of Iceland, it indicates a considerable amount of freedom of action there. Well, thank you very much, Major. That seems to cover the military situation up to the moment, and of course, if these Copenhagen reports are correct, there may not be any further military situation. That is to say, if the Finnish government actually has resigned, and if Minister Connor has gone to Moscow to seek an armistice. We don't know whether that is true as yet, but we expect to hear more about it in the course of the evening. And so far, as far as we know, the Finns are still fighting. You have just heard Elmer Davis and Major George Fielding Elliott in an analysis of the latest developments in Europe. <laughs>